Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Yuji Kawada, uh, Deputy Director of the Japanese Financial Service Agency. Uh, today, uh, I'm moderating this session. So uh, first of all, um, I would like to uh, thank you all for uh, joining this session today. Uh, in Poland and in France, it is very uh, early in the morning, uh, whereas the, it is very late at night in New York. So uh, I would like to express my biggest gratitude to all the panelists uh, for today's session. So uh, please uh, let me briefly introduce uh, three remarkable uh, speakers from around the world. Uh, Roberto Patelado, a uh, deputy head of division in OECD. Uh, he manages the OECD's Committee mm -hmm. on Financial Markets and directs the division's work on uh, global financial market, digitalization of finance, and sustainable finance. Welcome, Robert. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Jacek uh, Czarneki, a uh, global legal counsel at the Maker Foundation. Uh, he is responsible for global legal uh, matters and public uh, policy at Maker, and he is also an active participant uh, in several uh, international blockchain initiatives. Thank you, Jacek. Okay. Hello, everyone. Okay. And the final speaker is Aaron Light, a famous uh, professor at the uh, Benjamin N. Cardoso School of Law. Uh, he directs the Cardoso Blockchain Project, and uh, he has lots of publications. He, his first book, uh, Blockchain and the Law, uh, attracted <coughs> uh, much attention uh, in this field, in this emerging field. Welcome, Aaron. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So uh, the idea of this session is uh, that they are, after three panelists' uh, brief introductions, I'd like to ask two questions to all the panelists, uh, highlighting the opportunities and risks of DeFi. OK, so to, be, to begin with, um, I would like to ask uh, each panelist to introduce himself or say uh, some kind of uh, introductory remarks for about uh, two or three minutes, uh, starting from Robert, uh, followed by Jacek and Aaron. So, uh, Robert, good morning. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you please uh, mention an um, introductory remark for about uh, two or three minutes, please? Sure. And at this point, should we be talking about the benefits and risks or just high level? Uh, please, just high level is enough. Sure, absolutely. So I'm Rob Patrolano. Um, as, you, as you said, I manage the Committee on Financial Markets at the OECD. And before that, was at the Financial Stability Board in the New York Fed for a number of years. And the remarks that I will be making today are my own. But of course, they will span some of the experiences from those institutions. Uh, I, I think that the, the the experience that we've all had looking at um, alternative forms of finance in the post-crisis era, moving from market-based finance and now moving into the virtual world of, um, of crypto assets has been fascinating. Uh, there are a lot of potential benefits and of course uh, they, bring, they bring risks. And some of the discussions that, that we'll be having today and then like to focus on is better understanding exactly, exactly the virtual forms of traditional finance and how they've come about, um, what type of activities they are, if they're if they're parallel or very different than these traditional forms. And I think we can say the answer is yes, that, that they, they are different in some fundamental ways, how they interact with technology and what the implications are. And this is just getting away from the use of, of, of finance by individuals and institutions, but really thinking more broadly about the architecture of the financial system, implications for monetary policy, and then the um, the, the the need for for a rethink of, of regulation in this area to make sure it flourishes and that it's safe for 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 all who use it. Why don't I end it there? Okay, uh, thank you, Lobat. So uh, next, uh, good morning, uh, Jacek. Uh, could you please? Uh, mention some introductory remarks or introduce yourself for uh, two or three minutes, sure. please. Uh, of course. Morning, everyone, uh, and thank you very much for having me here. You know, my reply when asked to appear on this panel was that uh, I will, of course, do, I would, of course, do that, no matter what time would be uh, right now in Europe, <laughs> uh, because it's, you know, it's it's just important. And now. Why is it important is that I think that uh, this panel represents the, the crucial uh, type of dialogue that we should be having right now. Because look at you know our individual profiles. We come from academia, uh, business, international organizations, and also uh, from a regulator. 
And this is exactly this type of discussion mm. that should be happening now in light of all the market developments that mm. we are seeing uh, and the development of DeFi that we are going to discuss today. So thank you very much again um, <laughs> and very happy about this opportunity. Okay, thank you very much, Jacek. So uh, finally, uh, good morning, uh, good evening, Alan. Sorry. <laughs> thank you for joining this session. Uh, could you please uh, some uh, say some introductory remarks? Yeah, thank you so much. It's really an honor to be on this this panel, uh, and I think as uh, Yasek and Robert also indicated, um, you know what we're seeing with blockchain technology, and in particular in the Ethereum ecosystem, is a continuing development of what the broad vision of this technology is, uh, which is to not just serve uh, as a means to transfer digital assets, but begin to structure uh, the transfer of those digital assets in much, much more complex ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really the focus of my work, um, which is to, as a professor at Cardozo Law School, uh, to look into these questions, to think about uh, some of the risks and opportunities, as Robert mentioned, uh, and to try to come up with uh, ways to address um, the the newer forms of how this technology is being implemented so that it can be squared uh, with either existing regulatory uh, systems or um, in ways that we can begin to construct uh, new approaches to, to regulating uh, this technology. Mm. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to describing and discussing uh, the opportunities and the risks as part of this panel. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, great remarks by all the participants. So uh, now uh, moving on to the uh, first question. Uh, well, uh, uh, looking back to uh, two years ago, um, uh, it was like um, if of the movement of DeFi or decentralized finance. Um, at that time, uh, of course, uh, there were uh, several decentralized exchanges uh, such as the IDEX or the Waves DEX. Um, however, the liquidity was uh, fairly uh, limited and there was not so much attention uh, from the wider community. Um, however, uh, during uh, these two years, uh, we have seen an uh, uh, explosive growth of DeFi, and uh, uh, we have now a variety of DeFi applications, uh, including uh, Make MakerDAO, uh, Compound, uh, <coughs> Uniswap, and DYDX. So uh, as a first question, uh, I'd like to ask uh, each part panelist about any thought on the uh, opportunities and challenges of DeFi um, for about uh, maybe six or seven minutes, but uh, you can talk as much as you can. <laughs> so uh, starting from the uh, Alon, uh, followed by Jacek and Robert. So uh, Alon, uh, could you please uh, explain a brief brief overview of DeFi to the uh, general audience and also uh, gives us your views on uh, opportunities and uh, challenges. Maybe, for example, challenges, yeah. legal challenges that DeFi players may face or whatever you want. So Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, as noted, decentralized finance, uh, also known as DeFi, it's uh, probably one of the fastest, if not the fastest, uh, growing part of the blockchain ecosystem at this point in time. And it's happened, uh, like we've seen um, in other use cases for blockchain technology, um, we've seen it grow incredibly fast in an uh, incredibly short period of time. Um, and at their core, you know, DeFi protocols use a technology called smart contracts uh, to create financial services and other products uh, that aim to be non-custodial in nature. Uh, so they ideally do not rely on one central party. Instead, they're using the smart contracts, usually uh, one or more smart contracts, uh, in order to facilitate a, a financial activity um, without the need for the central party. But today, in practice, many still do. Uh, but but that's the goal. Um, you know, there's lots of jargon related to decentralized finance. Uh, so these applications are often administered via <coughs> online protocol portals called DApps. Uh, they're often supported by individuals who pool together their assets into liquidity pools. Uh, those that deposit their assets into liquidity pools lock their assets and often earn fees uh, and or automatically receive digital assets in the form of governance tokens. Hmm. Uh, and the practice of submitting assets uh, to DeFi protocols is increasingly referred to as liquidity mining uh, or yield farming. I think taking it up a notch, what we're seeing emerge is that digital assets are developing a, year, a yield curve, uh, an arguable uh, basis for value, uh, 
which is dependent on the time value of locked assets. And those locked assets have uh, grown exponentially over the past year in particular. Uh, so as of today, uh, there's $14 billion in locked, locked assets, and most notably, uh, two plus billion dollars in Bitcoin uh, that's being locked on Ethereum or used on Ethereum, and a yield is being generated off of that. Uh, so the landscape of, of DeFi is emerging, and it's emerging quickly uh, using these smart contract-based systems. So we're seeing uh, DEXs, which were mentioned before, uh, but also borrowing and lending protocols, which also oftentimes anchor, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, stable coins. Uh, we're seeing derivative and synthetic asset protocols, insurance, prediction markets, and we're also seeing an entire ecosystem being built on top of these protocols that serve as kind of an aggregation layer. Uh, so there's DEX aggregators, uh, and yield and asset management protocols uh, that are emerging. You know, DEXs are probably the most mature, and at least um, from a U.S. vantage point, some of, some of the DEXs are actually surpassing more centralized exchanges like Coinbase in terms of daily volume. Um, and it, it's pointing towards a future where trading may be increasingly pool to peer. Mm. Uh, so instead of going through a centralized, uh, uh, centralized exchange uh, or an order book of some sort, uh, you can use these uh, decentralized protocols, which rely on automated market make maker formulas, uh, to begin to to facilitate trades. Uh, so the benefits here, there's many of them, right? There's potentially lower costs, uh, a higher degree of security, and potentially over time privacy, as more privacy-preserving technology is kind of baked into these protocols. Uh, there's greater accessibility because it's available to everybody online, uh, which could lead to greater financial inclusion. Um, there's also the hope of having community-run financial infrastructure supported by uh, a, a community that's governing these networks. So think of uh, financial protocols that operate a little bit more like Wikipedia as opposed to uh, being administered by a corporation. They're permissionless, which cuts both ways, but uh, can be seen as a potential benefit. And they're also interoperable and composable. So since it's all software and it can all talk to one another, it works seamlessly together. Uh, you know, that being said, there's lots of risks and, and challenges. It's not mature yet. Uh, it's it's very difficult to interact with uh, decentralized protocols if you're not familiar with blockchain technology. Uh, so there's quite a steep learning curve. And there's obviously a number of regulatory challenges. Um, and those regulatory risks uh, are not going to be surprising for, for lawyers or other folks that uh, <clears throat> operate in the financial services industry. Uh, there's commodities laws issues, particularly protocols that are aiming uh, to uh, create something like an option or a derivative or something in that vein. Uh, there's securities laws issues, particularly for projects that have governance tokens in some capacity, uh, whether or not they're, they'll be classified as securities or uh, non-securities is still an open question. Uh, and obviously there's lots of AML, know your customer compliance issues, uh, especially since many of these are permissionless. Uh, so this all kind of roots down to a question, assuming that a number of these projects are decentralized, i.e. there's not one central party running it, who should be responsible for these regulatory requirements? Should it be the software developers or the parties or folks that deploy the smart contracts? Should it be the participants in the pools, the, those that are providing liquidity? Uh, some have even argued recently in, in the US that it may be the node operators or the people running the network. Uh, or you know, should we push the responsibility onto centralized parties that uh, aggregate or facilitate transactions? Uh, so there's lots of open questions, lots of uh, looming issues, uh, and obviously lots of opportunities um, that uh, that I think uh, folks are uh, curious <coughs> about exploring. So, okay, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Alan, uh, for uh, your quite uh, comprehensive remark. Thank you very much. So, um, so. Um, Jacek, um, as a well-known uh, DeFi player, uh, could, could you give us uh, your view uh, on the opportunities, maybe uh, from the uh, DeFi player perspectives, and uh, uh, if possible, how your organization facilitates the development of MakerDAO uh, while reducing the uh, uh, several uh, legal or technical challenges? Of course, thank you. Um, and just in, con in continuation of um, Aaron's words, um, I think that it's really important to uh, spend a moment thinking about um, the, like the basic word that we are discussing now, DeFi. Mm -hmm. It's already a buzzword, right? Uh, so uh, we are not spending too much time on like thinking what's behind it. Uh, but a year ago or two years ago, actually the like, e equally often used term was open finance. Uh, that many people were, use were using, were referring to this type of um, 
phenomenon. Um, and I think that this is really important to say that decentralization is not the only feature or not the uh, not the only value proposition behind uh, this um, uh, this market or this industry. And that was mentioned by Aaron already, but. Um, I think that this is where uh, we can see or where the, the opportunities of DeFi stem from so that we have um, uh, you know, something that is open, uh, that is also permissionless that Aaron mentioned, uh, Aaron mentioned but also uh, that is uh, secure, mm -hmm. uh, that is composable, again, uh, something mentioned already, um, and that is also transparent. And out of those uh, value propositions, you can see that at least some of them should be of, uh, you know, extreme interest uh, of, of policymakers and regulators, especially the security and transparency mm. part, but also the openness part. Mm. Uh, we can see in, in many countries, in many jurisdictions around the globe, we can see measures taken in order to improve this, um, uh, you know, this measures of the financial industry, like PSD2 uh, in Europe, in a, you know, adopted in order to open uh, some financial products or financial networks to others uh, or transparency crucial on, on capital markets where the fight uh, with information asymmetry is like one of the core features. And, you know, those uh, value propositions are kind of embedded in DeFi, right? These are like a kind of natural uh, uh, features of this of this industry and this trend in, in, in finance. Hmm. Now, what is crucial is that um, all of those features, they apply to those uh, fundamental networks or protocols. Um, those, uh, I sometimes call them um, um, open and permissionless um, 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 settlement uh, networks or, or settlement protocols, right? Those, those basis, uh, basic networks, which are usually indeed uh, decentralized, permissionless, they are open, secure, etc. Um, uh, now, uh, what we are most often discuss discussing is uh, various applications that are built on top of those networks. Uh, and those uh, may follow uh, the spirit of, or this philosophy um, of uh, building um, decentralized, permissionless mm -hmm. open products, but some of them um, are uh, a little bit more hybrid, right? Mm -hmm. So you have this opposition between decentralized finance and centralized finance, but indeed uh, you have a lot of in between. And this is a particular challenge that I would highlight uh, to uh, you know, figure out uh, very often at, at very specific cases, whether it is actually decentralized or centralized or very based, uh, looking from the perspective of various you know, regulatory regimes. And mm. uh, now um, I think that what we should be focusing on is not those aspirational decentralized finance, but the actual decentralized finance. And this is where I can get to your second question, which is about um, how the Maker Foundation is approaching or, or seeing those issues, because uh, this is, you know, our approach is really to focus on building a, a truly or contributing to building a truly decentralized ecosystem. And our role in this in this ecosystem should be like could be compared to, to this of the Ethereum Foundation, which is more of like a coordinating activity and uh, 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 you know a f a development and, and education funding activity with respect to Ethereum, which is a completely decentralized system. Um, and the very similar a very similar philosophy is, is followed by the Maker Foundation. So we are not MakerDAO. MakerDAO is this decentralized ecosystem that is governing the Maker Protocol. Um, uh, which is, uh, you know, taking care of themselves in a way because it's completely, you know, independent, separate, uh, but also self-sustaining at this point. Um, and of course, that doesn't mean that there are no legal challenges. Of course, they are. Um, but I think that what is really crucial is to be like, uh, uh, draw these boundaries really clear. So really be really clear about where, where, you, where you are talking about something that is actually decentralized and where we are talking about some centralized features that may also be discussed with the regulators. Um, and this is a kind of our approach. Uh, we want to um, engage in this discussion and uh, educate and be really clear about where those boundaries lie um, and how we can um, you know, approach this from a regulatory perspective, which I believe we'll also further discuss later on. Okay. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much uh, for your very uh, insightful comment. Um, okay. So um, finally, uh, Robert, uh, as an uh, experienced uh, global policymaker, um, could you please give us your view on the demand uh, and the opportunities of DeFi? And also, uh, could you give us uh, potential risks 
or uh, regulatory concerns uh, from the wider perspective, including uh, financial stability, uh, consumer, customer, uh, consumer investor protection, and competition? Yes, and koata san thank you so much for inviting me to this panel. Uh, and and I, I agree with Jacek that bringing together our four respective areas is really um, what it's all about. It's, it's very important to have these conversations and also to understand um, where some of the challenges may lie in the future to unlock the benefits. So what I would like to do is to talk, as you said, about some of the benefits and risks and, and, and policy implications. And I would like to um, to begin the discussion with um, with the Financial Stability Board framework uh, that we were at the OECD as a, as a member of the Financial Stability Board as our regular regulators and central bankers across the world. And uh, this, I think this is useful for two reasons. One, it's a simple framework. And two, it was created during the Japanese presidency a little over a year ago. And one would argue that some aspects of DeFi have really um, morphed since then that make us need to, to, to think about it in, in, in a forward looking way. So, okay, so I would say that if DeFi is thinking about centralized financial, decentralized financial instruments, mostly used to trade and build leverage upon uh, crypto assets, and this really departs from traditional uh, finance, we have to think about the ways how, and the FSB document laid it out, payments, trade finance, P2P lending, and of course, capital markets through tokenization. And it's that last one that I would like to talk about today, because that really has had some explosive growth and and impressive benefits and opportunities and, and my my um, panelists co-panelists here have described described those benefits i will simply say i agree with those potential benefits but i think it would behoove me to talk a little bit more about the risks and financial stability implications now of course we need to be forward looking to really capture the nature of this discussion so if i get beyond where the market currently is let's at least appreciate this trajectory so I would say that there, um, there are a few risks the FSB had mentioned too. First, the concern over the potential for collateralized borrowing, which could contribute to pro-cyclicality. And the second is that the growth of DeFi could lead to some important areas of concentration that might have to do with control of resource code, crypto asset mining activities, et cetera. So why don't we start with that and I'll list uh, four to five areas and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll allow for further consideration. First, uh, we have to acknowledge the phenomenal growth of crypto asset ownership um, and the market cap, uh, even over the past over the past year. Right. There was a, a peak with Bitcoin, a crash. And then, of course, in part due to monetary policy and fiscal policy in response to the, the, the unfortunate issue with COVID has put a lot of liquidity in the system. And you're seeing a lot of assets, securities and real assets that are forming a bubble. And of course, a good a, a portion of this liquidity now is moving to the DeFi world and causing what could arguably be open to interpretation some some bubbles in that area and this could set the stage for wider price swings which of course is a financial stability concern now the second issue is about relatively um uh the the use of leverage i can appreciate that there is certainly collateralization and, and high levels of collateralization in in the, the borrowing um, that's allowed within within DeFi or that's accepted within the DeFi space. But notwithstanding the collateralization, there's still uh, certainly room for a lot of leverage. And you're seeing the transformation of the instruments in DeFi creating high levels of leverage and fast moving assets. So when I see that, I start to think, OK, this isn't traditional finance per se. This is market based finance and getting into some of the complexities whether it's transparent or opaque, we could debate, but it's getting into some of the complexities that we see in market-based finance and that have triggered uh, a large amount of regulatory responses, regulatory reforms from the G20 over the past decade. So we should have that in mind, that, that do all of these reforms um, apply to these new activities? I would say not yet. Maybe in concept, but in practice, it's hard to pin down. The third issue has to do with... Um, the, the new forms of pooling of assets, right? So to get additional fees, the pooling of assets uh, into accounts, and that has benefits and risks. But I would say when you're looking at yield farming, perhaps one could one could compare this to some of the structured collective investment vehicles. I know the structures are different than CLOs, but the thinking of pooling assets together, locking assets, creating some sort of yield curve, um, playing with liquidity transformation, well, that too has received a regulatory response over the past decade, and um, and, and for good reason. And we're already seeing that the that that, that regulators 
are turning to forms of market-based finance that are creating runs on liquidity. And the question I would have is, are, is there a potential for runs on liquidity in the virtual world that could spill over to real assets and household income and could spill over to the real economy? If yes, then we may have some challenges on our hand. Fourth is the false comfort of trusting the technology to self-regulate. And perhaps I'm getting ahead of myself here, but that's my interpretation. With a lot of these smart contracts, one gets the impression that the regulatory aspects and even some forms of monetary policy are addressed in the smart contracts because they self-regulate, the mechanisms allow for liquidity to be created or destroyed, and perhaps, perhaps that that works under normal circumstances. But the question is, under severe stress, does that lead to some outcomes that actually amplify risk and where additional policy tools might be needed to make sure it doesn't spill over to, um, to the real world, to real markets and the real economy. And then lastly, I'll leave you with this. Um, a year ago, the summer a year ago, the G7 uh, was, was alerted, as we all were, to the creation of a global stable coin, one global stable coin that, would ha that consumers would have access to and would have the possibility to allow consumers to take their money out of traditional banks and put it into a stable coin that they could use for multi-currency accounts, whether, whether they need that or not. What's happening in DeFi, I think, really is provocative because it brings an enormous amount of potential benefits, but also the risks uh, associated with the leverage, with the pooling, with the pro-cyclicality are higher, and that creates implications for monetary policy transition. So if central bankers and regulators around the world had such a swift response to one global stablecoin, and there are already now new, reg new sort of a new regulatory um, um, construct framework in place at a global level. What does it take for DeFi to 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 trigger that same response? Bubble leverage. Um, if there's one crash that affects the financial system, the real assets in the financial system, it will bring a lot of scrutiny. And I I think the question is a matter of when. So I will leave it at that. Go out of Thank you. Okay, um, um, thank you, Robert, um, for your very insightful comment, uh, uh, insightful uh, uh, suggestions uh, about the nature of DeFi. And uh, also, uh, um, you uh, thank you for explaining uh, regulatory concerns uh, to very easily understandable to the audience. Okay, um, so, okay, based on the uh, discussion so far, um, now uh, moving on to the uh, last questions. Um, as uh, all the panelists mentioned, uh, there are a range of challenges that need to be addressed, in the, especially in the DeFi space. So the risks, um, as uh, Yacek and Robert uh, mentioned, uh, the risks uh, may uh, further be uh, amplified by being combined with the uh, other concurrent movement, concurrent trend, uh, such as the uh, Ethereum version 2, uh, Taproot Senior Signature in Bitcoin, or the uh, global stablecoin, uh, like DM, <laughs> the name has changed, or the uh, central bank digital currency, like ESNY, uh, that is a digital yuan, and uh, G20s are uh, enhancing uh, cross-border payment. So uh, there are lots of movement uh, is going in parallel. So we, with that in mind, um, I will ask uh, each panelist about uh, his view on the uh, <coughs> possible measures to address uh, the challenges of DeFi to, 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 to strike a balance between your potential benefit and risks uh, for around uh, two or three minutes. <laughs> but uh, of, of course you can, please, <laughs> of course you don't care about the time limit. So uh, starting from the robot, uh, followed by Jacek and Alan. So, Robert, thank you very much for uh, giving us uh, your regulatory concerns. Um, so, uh, based on your comment, uh, could you give us your view on the uh, possible measures to address uh, those challenges or um, other policy implications of these measures? Uh, or, sorry, uh, or um, how are international orga organizations such as uh, OECD uh, can help countries or DeFi communities to help address the challenges? Sorry, I, I, <laughs> I asked too many questions, but <laughs> please. No, no, I, 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 will, I will try to answer all three within three minutes. Thank you, Kawada-san. <laughs> no, no. 
<laughs> Thank from you. Aaron and Yatchek, their smiles. I'm sure they have a lot to say, so I'll I try to keep it fairly brief. So I, I'll do it in, in, in a, a different order. I will I will first look at the policy implications of what we discussed, leaving off from the stablecoin discussion. I'll basically say that the FSB has put out policy guidance, and we've been a part of that. And that's that's wonderful. That addresses the financial stability concerns of stablecoins at a very high level. But it doesn't address it doesn't address a lot of issues. That was really about just cross cross um, uh, uh, market risks. But I would say that when you're getting into issues of um, competition, issues of taxes, issues of consumer financial protection, et cetera, uh, data, data security, there are a lot of issues that it acknowledges have not been addressed. So I think the international community, regulators need to address those issues. Um, and I will start at a very basic level. We've, we've even here on this panel, we've talked a little bit about interoperability and governance. I think that for blockchain and DLT, more needs to be done in this area in a positive way, just to, to create a, a better um, playing field for interoperability, governance. Um, so the OECD, <coughs> excuse me, the OECD is working on policy um, uh, policy guidance on that area for global standards, for interoperability, governance, transparency and accountability, um, digital security and data privacy among some other areas. Mm. And this is important just to make sure that, that, that all of the um, players in the community are comfortable that, that that the infrastructure that's being built in a decentralized way works. Uh, that's that's quite important, particularly with these levels of liquidity and leverage. Again, getting back to sort of market-based finance or the old word shadow banking, just to make sure that we do have a transparency that works right. Uh, and then the second issue is turning to DeFi again, where the central decentralization has taken on forms of market-based finance. We need to address the excessive leverage and liquidity. And I might turn to things like um, the, the IOSCO has, has frameworks in the traditional world. And it's very easy to say, well, the frameworks are there, different jurisdictions can apply them. Well, I think what jurisdictions, what regulators are finding challenging is to really identify exactly what those activities are and what the risks are from the activity as they're moving very quickly and, and, and they're transforming. And to try and put them into the current regulatory framework is, is challenging. So what we do as an international organization of my committee is we bring central bankers, regulators, finance ministries together to discuss these issues. And in fact, we are cre we've, we've created implications for, for regulation with respect to tokenization of assets. Mm. And we're looking at different case studies around the world to better understand how um, regulators, even with some similar regulations, are trying to apply those to different forms of tokenization and DeFi. Uh, so I think further work in that area is important to really understand what these risks are and how the regulation should apply to them. And of course, as as the panelists, our panelists mentioned, some of those activities have changed so much that it's hard to know who the regulation applies to. And, and getting that right is, is a challenge. Um, I would also say that as we're creating a toolkit for regulators at the OECD, I would just throw out that the European Commission's recent uh, micro-legislation on crypto assets gives us a glimpse of how a body can say, yes, we are tech neutral, but given that the technology empowers activities that can create some new risks, let's try and tailor um, regulation, legislation for regulation to try and address some of those specific activities in a way that gives us comfort that the risk can be addressed, particularly if they become financial stability risks. And then lastly, I would say, um, Perhaps this is for next year's conversation, uh, but I think even a year to years from now, we might be talking about re-DeFi, which is the re-centralization of digitalized finance. Because I, I think, and from what I'm reading, there are some aspects of decentralized finance in order to regulate them appropriately uh, and to understand their impact on monetary policy, there may need to be a re-centralization so that regulators and the, the industry can interact in a constructive way without undermining the benefits of the decentral, decentralization with respect to speed, cost, et cetera. And I would say that one area that's quite interesting is with the, the DFMI, um, the decentralized financial market infrastructures. There may be opportunities there to recentralize into MFI certain, certain activities, code, government, governance, et cetera, a way to get regulatory comfort and regulatory oversight without undermining 
uh, uh, the many potential benefits that are being discussed today, uh, including on this panel. Let me end there. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to, to review these issues. Mm, thank you, Robert. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your very uh, creative uh, ideas. Um, um, I, I've never thought of the DFMI before, so <laughs> uh, it's very interesting. So, um, uh, Jacek, um, could you please uh, give us uh, your view on the possible measures and uh, how a uh, DeFi player can, can contribute to the, uh, those measures? Absolutely. Thank you, Kevada san And uh, you're very kind uh, with respect to time uh, that you're giving <laughs> us, but I think that we're uh, coming to an end. So let me just limit to one comment on this, uh, which I think is most crucial. I think that the situation at this current panel is very is great, but very specific at the same time. Because look, we are, uh, as, as Aaron from Academia and myself from, let's say, the business side, we are discussing with a representative of the probably most sophisticated regulator in the world with respect to those matters and absolutely the best international organization with, uh, with regard to dealing with those topics as well. And this is based on my experience with uh, many jurisdictions and a couple of international organizations. But this type of like this level of sophistication, uh, knowledge um, and experience is not equal um, across all the jurisdictions. And I think that this is really crucial because in many countries around the globe, but also among many policymakers uh, and also market participants, there is a huge like knowledge gap and also lack of uh, sometimes lack of like kind of um, uh, ability to connect meaningfully with respect of this type of uh, conversation. And I think that this is something that is very much needed because we are dealing with extremely, um, extremely complex topics which are not free of risks, uh, that's, that's for sure. And all of those risks, especially uh, outlined by Robert, they really apply. And especially with this, with this, you know, in this ecosystem of projects that are either fully decentralized, hybrid, or even just, uh, you know, centralized, but just in some way using the smart DeFi, um, and that's very, very difficult to, to, to come up with some conclusions. And we see a lot of confusion at the moment uh based on you know from the market but also in this policy making discussion i think that one good example is the recent discussion of, of um, around self-custody in some specific countries but also at, at the international level there is really a lot of confusion that is not stemming from the the complexity of the topics itself but rather from some yeah from some perhaps misunderstandings uh or, or lack of uh, appropriate dialogue so one measure uh to to, to finish at this point i one measure is is really I keep mentioning this, but this is crucially important to keep this conversation going and to participate in various initiatives that bring um, various stakeholders together uh, to discuss and come up with solutions. And I, can, I, I can mention two such initiatives. One of them is um, the current um, uh, uh, initiative uh, organized by the uh, World Economic Forum um, around this topic, really bringing together various uh, representatives from, from all possible sides, uh, uh, having them together to discuss, discuss those, those matters. Um, and there, are, there is, of course, uh, um, many others, uh, but, but the other one that I wanted to mention is the one that is um, um, organized by your colleagues, uh, Kawada san, uh, and, and uh, focused around the multi stakeholder approach to. Uh, blockchain governance and regulation, and in particular, DeFi governance and, and, and regulation. And I think that this is uh, the way forward because there are many unknowns, many things that we haven't figured yet. But this is the only way that we can move forward um, among the, you know, and, and build trust, which is also that that's a kind of a paradox that we are talking about technologies that are that are trustless. But at the end of the day, what we have all have to do, and this is certain tasks. Uh, is to is to build trust among ourselves so that we can come up with meaningful solutions. Mm. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Yacek. So, um, I, I sorry, um, I would like to ask you, uh, Alon, but uh, uh, um, I saw the, I'm sorry, the time is running out. So, um, uh, so now uh, let me uh, once again say great thank to uh, Alon, uh, Yacek, and Robert. Uh, for participating in this session from overseas. And uh, please give a big uh, applause to the all three uh, panelists. And thank you very much for uh, this uh, fruitful discussion today. Thank you very much. <laughs>